From assault rifles to armored trucks and even drones, since the 9-11 attacks, the U.S. police have become increasingly militarized. But does that mean more safety for Americans? You're watching Inside Story, Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Shihab Ritansi. In the last decade, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, established after the September 11th attacks, has handed out tens of billions of dollars in grants to local police. With that money, local law enforcement agencies have acquired battle gear designed for war rather than public safety. An investigation by the Center for Investigative Reporting found that some police departments have been transformed into, quote, army-like forces because of the equipment they use. Police say they need the combat gear to respond to terrorist attacks, such as the one in Mumbai in 2008, which included 11 coordinated shootings and bombings. They say the gear is also needed to go up against well-armed criminals. But the most visible use of that equipment has come as they dispersed largely peaceful protests like those seen at the height of the Occupy Wall Street movement. And in July of this year, in the Californian city of Anaheim, police officers looked like they were prepared for war as they surrounded unarmed protesters demonstrating against police brutality. Al Jazeera's Fault Lines presenter Seb Walker has more from Anaheim. When a few hundred demonstrators attempted to march through the city to Disneyland several days after the earlier protests, they were met with an entirely different police response. And we started uh, moving and, and try, uh, walking to protest. That's when you saw SUVs, guys hanging outside of the SUVs with, you know, assault rifles over their shoulders. When I first saw them drive up, my heart skipped a beat. By getting into military fatigues, having SUVs running and police on horseback, it creates this, this escalated militaristic feel. What can you do when you have pretty much a military against you? No one is armed. No more was armed. We well, weren't armed. We didn't have any weapons. The highly militarized nature of the response shocked everyone in Anaheim. It looked like your officers were prepared for some kind of urban warfare. That was uh, entirely inappropriate. That was when I saw the newspaper the next day and opened it up and saw a picture of a armored vehicle traveling down Anna Drive with SWAT people hanging on the outside with fully automatic weapons. I mean, I was shocked as well, and I was not happy. So and you didn't I, know about it? No, I didn't know about it. Where did the order come from? It came from a lieutenant in that group, and I held the lieutenant accountable. Whether it was deliberate or not deliberate, I think the message was, it couldn't have been more clear. And the message was, if you continue this, we will treat you like we're in, a, in the middle of a war. You know, no, nobody's going to be so willing to go up and speak up when, when you do, you got the military on you. You know, you, when you do, you got, got freaking pigs and horses coming at you. You know, treating you like, like you're, 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 you're way less than them and they can do as they please because it's not your city, it's their city. I'm not naive. I know that we have a problem with trust. I know that I have to make changes in this organization in order to regain that trust. And you can watch the entire Fault Lines documentary, Anaheim, A Tale of Two Cities, online at aljazeera.com forward slash programs forward slash fault lines. So what are the risks of having a militarized police force in the U.S.? To discuss this, we're joined from Austin, Texas, by George Schultz. He's one of the authors of that report by the Center for Investigative Reporting that we mentioned earlier. From Chicago, Norm Stamper, former Seattle police chief and author of the book Breaking Rank, a top cop's expose of the dark side of American policing. And from Nashville, Tennessee, we're joined by senior Huffington Post writer Radley Balco. Um, there's so many aspects to what happened in Anaheim, uh, many of which we've discussed in a previous Inside Story, which can still be seen actually on the web. But for our purposes today, let's, let's focus then on the militarization that was on display. Norm Stamper. Help us understand the thinking, the, the conceptual framework that led to the deployment of what was basically a paramilitary force on the streets of Anaheim that day. Well, let me begin with the idea that that conceptual framework is terribly important. People tend to fixate on events and don't appreciate what's happening, uh, happening to the institution and to these police organizations. 
Uh, American law enforcement is paramilitary. It always has been. We've simply seen an escalation and a very large one uh, since 9-11 and uh, leading into the Occupy movement as well. So when you say that the, the police forces have always been paramilitary, what, what, what do you mean by that? I, I thought they were a civilian police force. Well, they are a civilian police force, but they operate according to a paramilitary organizational arrangement. It's a very heavily command and control oriented institution. The word comes down typically from the top, although we did hear uh, and see an example of where that doesn't always happen. And the tendency, I think, is to, is to treat one's police officers as foot soldiers in the war on crime or the war on drugs. And that kind of mentality carries over uh, into the policing of protests throughout the country. But, but Mr. Stamper, I mean, what, what would you say are the distinctions then that there should be between what we call a paramilitary force and what we call a police force? Well, a, a police force, uh, one that is committed to public safety and to establishing a trusting, authentic partnership between the cops and the community is one that doesn't look like today's police departments. This paramilitary orientation uh, is reflected in the uniforms, in the equipment, and as you've noted in your introduction, uh, in the tens of billions of dollars that have been given to local law enforcement in order for them to look, mili uh, in order for them to carry out essentially military missions, whether it's a drug raid or the policing of a protest movement. Um George Schultz, you've done a great deal of, of, of research then in, into the changes of, of police forces over the last few years. Um, what, what do those changes actually mean? Then let's begin actually with that psychological framework of police officers that, that you've discovered as they, are, um, as they are given more and more sophisticated weaponry. So as Radley will tell you that Homeland Security grants are just one factor in, in all this, and that's important to understand. But what we did was spend a lot of time looking at the role of Homeland Security grants, the swell in Homeland Security grants spending after September 11th, the amounts of money that Washington began doling out to state and local governments uh, to, uh, to prepare for future events, uh, high consequence, low probability events like September 11th that are frankly rare. So what, what we see today is uh, uh, our law enforcement agencies around the country that perceive the threats they face every day as different than what they may have perceived in the 1980s and 1990s um, during the crack epidemic when a lot of folks were focused on community-oriented policing and attempting to improve the image uh, of law enforcement and the relationship law enforcement had with a lot of communities in the United States. Now what we see is a lot of law enforcement agencies um, perceiving the potential for an event like Mumbai, an event like the September 11th attacks, uh, and up-armoring in response to the perceived threat of events like that. The reality is, is uh, terrorist attacks like September 11th uh, are, ex are extremely rare, but they, when they do occur, they, they strike a, a, a deep psychic blow to the societies that, that endure them. So you, it's, it's expected that you would see a response similar to, to the way we responded. The question then becomes, how far are you going to attempt to invest in achieving 100% security, which is impossible? Since you can't achieve 100% security, um, you can't have senior Homeland Security officials going up to Capitol Hill and telling lawmakers, well, we achieved 75 percent security because of what lawmakers are then going to ask is, is the 25 percent in my district? So because those types of quest honest questions aren't often asked on Capitol Hill, amid that we attempt to spend our way to 100 percent security um, and we can't achieve it. So we keep spending and spending and spending and spending um, without knowing when it's, it's time to feel completely safe. George, also, I mean, you, you attempted, though, to um, find out exactly how much money was being spent on these various programs since 9-11. I mean, how easy a task was that? Is it being collated? Are we, uh, are, um, is there oversight and, and judgment? Are there judgments being made about value for money at the very least, if not civil liberties and, and other issues that are related? No, that turned out to be extraordinarily difficult. There's no single source of information in Washington that will tell you in detail how these grants have been spent, $34 billion in, in grants so far the last 10 years. There's no database, no single system in Washington. And what Washington has done, what the Department of Homeland Security has done, is left a lot of that responsibility to the states. And the states are very inconsistent in terms of, of how they decide to distribute the money to, to local police, local communities, and how they oversee the spending. 
So what we did was attempt to go state by state using open government laws to obtain as detailed a data as possible on the line items of each, of each item that, that was purchased. Um, in some states we had a lot of great success. For instance, the state of Texas, we were able to obtain a large database showing community by community uh, what was purchased. On uh, many other states, if we were lucky to get any data at all, it lacked uh, detail and gave us no real insight into several years of hundreds of millions of dollars in grant spending. But where we ab were able to obtain data and records, we did see a lot of purchases, a lot of the same purchases appearing in community after community. Lots of armored personnel carriers, lots of military style uh, um, protective equipment, uh, similar to what you'd see warfighters wearing in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, um, bomb dismantling robots, uh, a, lot of, a lot of equipment and attire that you wouldn't have necessarily seen during the 80s and 90s. Radley then, tell us a bit more then a, a, about the sort of weaponry that you have um, discovered as you've investigated where all this money, money is going. Actually, there was a particular example in Jonestown, Rhode Island, which, which was quite interesting that you wrote about in the Huffington Post, a pretty small, a pretty small town with an amazing military arsenal. Yeah, well, um, th this does go back, uh, it predates 9-11 by about 20 years. Uh, it was really during the Reagan administration that we saw uh, a ratcheting up of the, the war on drugs and, and a, an effort to make the, uh, the, metaf the metaphor quite literal. Um, and in the early 90s, uh, the Congress passed uh, this program, this 1033 program through the Pentagon, uh, where the Pentagon started giving away surplus military equipment to police departments across the country. Uh, and so what you saw after that was, uh, you know, tanks and, and uh, uh, M16s and MP5s and armored personnel carriers, helicopters, uh, going from the Pentagon, and this is equipment that was, you know, built and designed to be used on a battlefield, uh, going to police departments across the country. Uh, and in, you, you had these absurdly small towns that were not then starting their own SWAT teams because, you know, you have this equipment and you might as well use it. Uh, and so what you saw was a massive, massive increase in the number of SWAT teams or, or paramilitary police units uh, across the country and a massive increase in, in uh, how often they were used. Uh, there's a criminologist who, who, who sent out surveys to, to figure out, you know, just how often these, these SWAT teams and these SWAT raids were being used. Uh, and he found in the early 80s they were used about 3,000 times per year uh, in the entire country. Uh, and by about 2,000 it was up to about 40 to 50,000 times per year. Uh, and the vast majority of that increase were to serve drug warrants uh, on people, search warrants on people suspected of nonviolent drug crimes. Uh, so September 11th and, and the, the DHS grants really kind of exacerbated the problem, but this, is, this militarization was going on, you know, well before the September 11th attacks. Um, what's interesting, though, I mean, there are some, though, who say this is a, it's not necessarily about the equipment, though, it's a matter of attitude. There was a, um, a U.S. congressman from Texas, Henry Cuellar, um, his state, um, and a great deal of military equipment from the war in Iraq has been shipped to police departments along the U.S. border with Mexico um, in Texas. So he, he was asked about the fear of militarization, and here's what he had to say. In order to be militarized, you have to have the soldiers there. Uh, all, you, all you're doing is using taxpayers' equipment uh, to be brought down by law enforcement. I trust the law enforcement that they will use that equipment uh, in, in, in the way they need it. They're not going to be asking for tanks, but they might ask for a helicopter or they might ask for a, a, a vehicle that they can use or equipment. So, I mean, Norma Stamper there, I mean, what, what, what he's saying is, look, you know, we, the equipment is more sophisticated, but we know we're police officers. We aren't, we aren't soldiers. Would you accept that argument? I would certainly accept that argument. The problem uh, comes when police officers transform themselves as a result of all of this military uh, equipment uh, into soldiers, uh, into an occupational force. Look, there are times in law enforcement where you need a military-like response. Uh, I happen to be present uh, in the immediate aftermath of the McDonald's massacre uh, in San Diego back in 1984. This is where we had a, a man by the name of James Huberty who shot and killed 20 people, women, children, men who were enjoying a, a, a hamburger at a fast food restaurant. Had we had an armored personnel carrier, we could have driven that vehicle up to the door, through that door, and taken this man out. As it was, we had to very delicately position a sniper who ultimately was able to end the threat. But by then, 20 people had died. So there is a time and there is a place for that equipment. We just need to recognize that day-to-day -day policing 
Much like 9-11, much like uh, the McDonald's massacre, these things come along periodically. Right. And then they have a way of just transforming daily practices and that's where we make the biggest mistake. But how much discussion I is underway, George, as far as you can tell then, about um, stringent guidelines of when to use all, all, this, all of this equipment? Or is it simply a matter of uh, arguing, well, look, if we have all this equipment, we might as well use it because, uh, as I think one of you was saying, you know, I mean, 100% safety is better than 50% safety in, in any given circumstance. Well, Chief Stomper is right in the sense there are events that occur in the United States that sometimes require a, a, a response from individuals who are particularly well trained and have um, um, a better protective gear to handle uh, situations like that. Um, the, the question is, uh, um, what sort of, of, of national data do we have, first of all, on special weapons and tactics deployments, for instance? Secondly, what sort of data do we have nationally on um, a lot of the new equipment that's been, been purchased on how often that equipment's uh, deployed. In other areas of criminal justice, we compile very detailed data to better understand what's happening in incarceration, in uh, uh, juvenile justice programs, recidivism, uh, things like that. We compile even with uh, things like wiretaps. When police deploy traditional wiretaps, they're required to uh, collect a lot of uh, data about the activity around that wiretap to ensure that the privacy and civil liberties of, um, of, of Americans are protected if they're not associated with the, with the criminal investigation. In the case of special weapons and tactics units, we don't have good data nationally on how often they're deployed. In fact, a lot of people who have looked at this subject have, have, have had to, uh, to lean on uh, uh, news reports uh, about uh, SWAT deployments, court records, uh, lawsuits about these deployments, but we don't have a lot of good information uh, nationally on, on training levels, um, uh, mandates or expectations in a law enforcement community on when it's appropriate to deploy a special weapons and tactic te tactics team. For instance, is it appropriate to deploy um, an armored personnel carrier and law enforcement uh, personnel dressed head to toe in combat style equipment to execute a raid on an individual's house who's suspected of, of growing marijuana? And they ha if they have no history of violent crime, is it appropriate to deploy all those resources? Right. Not only is it intimidating for the community where those resources are deployed, it's also cost intensive. Those, that, that activity costs taxpayer money. Radley Balka, I know you, you have tried though perhaps to look, to collate and document how policing itself has changed as a result of the routine deployment of um, you know, paramilitary gear and, and, and SWAT teams and, and so forth. I mean the effect then um, on abuse of power, I suppose, is the obvious, you know, is the obvious question, and, and, and violence. Um, what, what have you found? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, when, when these SWAT teams were first started uh, in the late 1960s in Los Angeles, they were in response to, to the Watts riots, to the, uh, the Texas uh, clock tower shooting, and, and these sorts of emergency type situations like the McDonald's massacre that Norm was talking about. Uh, what we saw in the 80s was this gradual transition to start using these same sorts of paramilitary tactics against drug offenders, uh, partially because we had politicians who, again, were really pushing the martial rhetoric and the war rhetoric. Um, what we've been seeing really, I would say, over the last 10 years or so, I think is even more disturbing. I mean, at least with the drug raids, you know, there was the, the, the pretext that, you know, dr well, drug dealers are violent and they tend to be well armed. Um, I, I, I have some quibbles with those, with those pretexts, but at least they were there. Um, what I think we've seen in the last 10 years is, is governments and, and law, or politicians and law enforcement officials, um, you know, the level of force that they're choosing to use uh, is not really based on uh, an assessment of the threat, a realistic assessment of the threat they're facing. Um, we're increasingly seeing the level of force being based on what sort of political message that they want to send. Uh, so, for example, uh, these federal raids on medical marijuana dispensaries uh, in states that have legalized medical marijuana. Um, this is insanity. I mean, nobody really thinks that, you know, the, the, the two old hippies running the medical marijuana clinic in California are going to pull a gun out from under the counter and, and open up on a bunch of federal agents. Um, they're sending SWAT teams into these dispensaries to send a message. They don't like the fact that these dispensaries are openly defying federal law. Um, and I think this is what we're seeing with a lot of these protest responses also. Uh, this is a, you know, this is a we don't like the politics of the people who are protesting, so we're going to bring out a, 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 you know, a massive show of force. Uh, to, to send a message. Uh, and th that, I think, is really, um, I mean, I, I think the drug war stuff was scary enough, but I think the more we're starting to see these SWAT uh, and paramilitary responses uh, to, to, you know, threats that, 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 that aren't really all that um, uh, serious, but that send a political message, I think we, we've entered new territory.
Uh, Norm Stamper, I mean, famously, you were the police chief during the protests against the WTO uh, in Seattle, the Battle of, uh, Battle of Seattle. Um, and you've long said that you know, the, the tactics used, the militarized tactics, were a mistake. Has anything really changed, or are we seeing an intensification of those same tactics, do you think, have, uh, when we look at uh, the, the, the summer's protests, for example? I, I'm afraid something has changed, and that is more and more police agencies are failing to learn the, the, the message of the Battle of Seattle. Uh, I made the worst mistake of my 34-year police career during that week. Uh, we talked openly about everything that we did wrong and attempted to disseminate that information throughout the law enforcement network. And of course, the World Trade Organization conference was before 9-11. So 9-11 hits, and what we see then is the federal agencies and local agencies all scrambling to make sure that these funnels for federal funds are created uh, and that revenue stream is provided uninterrupted uh, and all of these toys uh, of, of a military nature are, uh, are parceled out to police departments throughout the country. And as uh, you suggested, uh, when you got a toy, you, you want to play with it. And unfortunately, many of the people who have this equipment at their disposal are woefully undertrained or in some cases even untrained. Uh, I was especially uh, appreciative of John Welter's, Chief John Welter's comments after the Anaheim incidents. What he said was, we have lost trust with our community. What he also said is, we now need to make some major organizational changes, and that's really what's essential. Executive leadership at the political level, uh, at the level of, of police chiefs, uniting to transform the institution itself to recognize what a steep slope we have been on for the last 10 years. But is there any evidence that actually is happening? We there? can to dig in our hills and reverse it. Is, I'm there, sorry? is there any evidence that's actually happening though? Or is it again the incentivization uh, and indeed the, the, the ability to, you know, to, to want to cover your back basically by having all this equipment will, 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 will trump any, any sense of what the police force is actually for and what it should be used for, uh, Radley? Let me tell you, let me, um, let me tell yeah. you what no, I think quickly, very quickly, for no, a change. Sorry. A catalytic yeah. event, a major event uh, that, that people are talking about, aroused about, agitated about, produces a Department of Justice investigation, for example, then you'll get change. But it ought not to be uh, as bad as all of that for this change to take place. Radley, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think one reason why this has been a, this is this has happened sort of under our noses is that there there is uh, a kind of uh, political Schadenfreude that goes on when you see uh, police use disproportionate force against your political enemies. Uh, if you remember during the 1990s, it was actually the right that was really upset about militarization after the ATF raids. Uh, at Ruby Ridge and at Waco, and, and then a, a series of ATF raids on, on people suspected of committing uh, gun crimes all throughout the 90s. And it was really the right and right-wing talk radio that was raising this issue. And the left was sort of uh, kind of mocking them for it and defending the, 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 the aggressive tactics. Um, you know, after the Bush administration came into power, the right sort of went silent on this issue. Uh, and you saw kind of a similar glee that you saw from the left in the 90s. You saw a similar sort of glee from the right uh, in response to the, the crackdowns on the Occupy protest. Um, so I, I do think that, that part of it, there, there's not kind of a unified uh, effort because I think people sort of like to see the hammer brought down on, on their political enemies, which is really you know, sort of unfortunate. Um, I, do, I would say the one thing that we need to, or that, that, that will affect change is, is to start putting pressure on politicians. I mean, I think Norm's right that there has to be institutional leadership within the law enforcement community. But you know the politicians uh, have set these policies. You know it's Congress that uh, has made this Pentagon equipment program and in these DHS grants available. Uh, it's Congress that ties uh, you know uh, federal grants directly to drug policing, which provides an incentive then to use SWAT teams for for these nonviolent drug crimes. Right. Uh, and 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 it's the politicians that are really afraid of, of police organizations and are played, afraid to change these policies because they don't think they have political cover to do so. George Shulson, we've only got 30 seconds left, but I mean there's too much money being made, and also actually as the social fabric is stretched ever thinner because of budget cuts, ironically. Um, this, this sort of repressive police tactics become all too, too attractive to contain poorer communities who might be seen as you know, uh, potential for trouble. 
Yeah, not only that, but every time you invest in an armored personnel carrier or anything that's combat style or is purchased uh, with the justification that it would be used to uh, battle, a, you know, a low probability event or an event for which there's a you know low probability it will occur. That's a dime you're not spending in uh, homicide cases, homicide investigations, and in investigations of sexual assaults. You're making a decision uh, and you're prioritizing resources that way. And there's a tendency with federal grant programs that once they're cr the created. If you create billions of dollars in federal homeland security grants, suddenly every community in the United States is faced with the threat of terrorism and wants to go after that money and, and, and structures their grant applications in a, in a way that projects them as, as, as vulnerable as possible. And you see that across a lot of grant programs. So Washington sends a message about priority, uh, priorities when it creates these grant programs and funds them. George Schultz, thank you very much. Radley Balco, Norm Stamper, thank you both too. That's all from the team in Washington, D.C. for now.